welcome to Trinity Episcopal Parish's discussion of the foundations of Anglican spirituality. As you can probably tell, we are not indoors right now, we're outside. Because today is probably one of my favorite classes to do in the uh, Foundations class, which is a field trip that talks about the ritual and symbol you will see in our services. This is going to be a very hands-on thing, so it's going to be a trial and error as it comes to me trying to talk to you over live stream. But as we continue to move here and there, um, I will be explaining some of the symbols you are going to see. We are standing outside of our parish hall right now, and we're going to be walking across the street that direction towards our main worship space. And I'll be explaining what you see along the way, because every little thing that you uh, gaze at whenever you walk up to the church building is actually filled with symbol. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more as to why that is once we get there, and how we work and interact with the symbols and with the ritual in which we enact things. So I hope that you'll join me uh, along with this, and I hope that uh, no fire trucks run by whenever we're going outside. But let's go ahead and take a walk across the street, and we'll talk about what we see along the way. As you can see, we're at our education hall, and we're going to walk across our street right here. And as we approach the building, you'll notice on most Episcopal churches, the highest point of the building is always punctuated by a cross. If you can see it way up there, it's where our pigeons like to sit. But we're going past our courtyard right here, and the statuary of, of Christ our Lord. Something that you might not be able to notice immediately is that we also have a columbarium in our courtyard, which is a fancy way of saying um, places that we inter the beloved dead, those who are buried in Christ. Courtyards in the, the Anglican church and in the church in general um, have often served as places of burial. And this is actually for a very particular reason. The burial in the confines of the church grounds was seen as holy ground, holy burial. And it was a symbol, but even more than just a mere symbol, it was a real life in action of the hope that we have in the resurrection. And so we have uh, many of our beloved um, that lie here um, in the hope of the resurrection one day. And so um, this also serves as a very nice courtyard to be able to sit here and contemplate in God's creation. But, of course, we're going to walk up to our front steps. And the first thing you will notice about any Episcopal church is the red doors. The red doors of the church are red for a particular reason. They're red to symbolize the blood of Christ. Church doors, by the way, are particular, um, particularly interesting in the Christian tradition because at the entrance to churches, um, quite often, especially in Gothic churches and more specifically in Eastern Orthodox churches, above the door sill you will have a depiction of the revelation of John, the apocalypse of John, the end of the world. Because when we enter into the sanctuary, um, symbolically what we are doing is we are entering into not just a mortal worship, we're entering into a heavenly worship. We are entering into the heavenly worship that's already ongoing. And so the church as being the symbol of heaven is something that you'll find in Eastern Orthodoxy a lot. That's why whenever you walk in, you have icons of all the saints, because they are uh, very really present in the worship of our Lord Most High. But in the Episcopal Church, you'll have the red doors right here to symbolize the blood of Christ, because that is the only way by which we enter in. And so whenever you see an Episcopal Church with the red doors, you'll be able to see and understand that that's a symbolic act, a symbolic uh, use of the door frames themselves. Uh, the other thing that you will notice, if you look, 
Let me go ahead and just take a backup right here. The other thing that you'll notice is the architecture. So in White County, which is where we are right now, in Searcy, our church is the only example um, left in White County of what's called neo-Gothic architecture. Um, Neo-Gothic architecture is uh, particularly recognizable by very, very high ceilings, um, high vaults, um, and a lot of, um, and a lot of uh, length to the height of the building. Um, because one of the symbolic acts of our architecture is to symbolize that we are entering into a space that is meant for worship. We are entering into a space that is holy. Um, and in some ways, we're entering into a space that reaches up to the heights of heaven. And so what we're going to do, as we look at our plaque right here, you'll notice 1893 is when we were established, well over 100 years ago. And these are the doors symbolizing the blood of Christ by which we enter. So let's go ahead and hop inside. And now we enter into what is called the nave. In Neo-Gothic architecture, there are three specific um, designations of the space. And so even though this is technically one room, it is made up of three pieces. The nave, by the way, comes from the word naval, which think of navy or vessel or ship, because guess what? We're going to take a little peek up high. If you look up, you'll notice the trussing on the top is very unique. And in fact, if you can think about it this way, the trussing on the ceiling, if you, um, let's say, take the, pretend like you can take the church up and flip it upside down, it looks like the bottom of a boat, right? If you pretend like we're flipped upside down um, and by the magic of uh, technology and cameras, I'm actually gonna do this for you, if, you think about this, let me turn the auto-rotate function on my phone off. If you think about this upside down, woo! Think about it that way. Symbol of a boat, but specifically in the early church, it was a allegory of the ark. In fact, the letters of Peter talk about baptism as being symbolic of the Ark of Noah, being saved from the cataclysm. And so even in the architecture that you see, that's what you get. And the nave is where the congregation is seated. As you can tell, we have the pews that are uh, lining the side of the aisle. But architecturally, again, there are three particular spaces. We'll talk about them in, in turn, but the nave is where we're at right now. The chancel is basically at the beginning of the second flight of stairs. And the sanctuary is where the altar is. The altar is, of course, the most obvious thing in the, in the room. The high cross on the altar is the most visible thing. And those are the three sections of the church. But there's even more symbolism in the nave. And this is uh, readily apparent in the windows that you see. So, of course, notice if you look at the top, have symbols on them. You'll see a lion right there. You'll see a lamb with the Christian an eagle at the very front right there. We'll flip around to this side. You'll see... St. Luke is the ox. You'll see the man right there. Each of those symbols, by the way, is a reference to the four living creatures that you read about in the book of, uh, or in the book of Revelation. And the church 
has historically associated these four living creatures with the four gospels that we have. But one cannot properly think about Trinity Episcopal Parish without the Good Shepherd. This is the main stained glass in the back of the church. You saw it from the outside when we were walking up. But this is the Good Shepherd with the Trinity at the very top, because of course we're Trinity Parish. Shepherd being depicted. Now, sometimes people will ask, well, why is why for stained glass windows to be part of our worship or part of our well, if you think about this, actually, think about, like, to not be literate. In a very real way, literacy was a huge obstacle in the communication of the gospel. Because, of course, we have to be able to have some way of communicating this, right? And it's hard for us, who have lived post-15th century, to think of anything other than having books in our pews, literally, I mean, I scan past this, I have, there are, you know, there are 11 Bibles on the shelf over here right now. But friends, this is not the case for the early church. Printing was very expensive, often confined to some of the richer classes, so you have to have rich patrons of the church to be able to have copies of the Bible itself. And in fact, your trained clergy had to be, be able to read it as well in order to explicate, explain the gospel. And so what starts happening is depiction. The universal language for us as humans that we can start getting an idea of is depiction. So when we have pictures, when we have icons, stained glass, it was meant to tell the story of the gospel. And so, rather than this being something that should affront people as it comes to maybe Exodus chapter 20, you shall have no graven images or whatever, rather, the way that we communicate the story of the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the depiction of, like, for example, to the sides right here, the uh, depiction of the Gospels or something that cannot necessarily be explained in so many words, symbol and picture were huge assistances in this because people could gaze onto the depictions of the faith and in the various ways that it was explained and be able to gather or understand at least a little bit about what's being said. And of course that has to do with being able to communicate the gospel in a way that people can understand. And illiterate people can't read and illiterate people can't just pick up one of these Bibles down here and simply have a gaze at it. And so that's where our pictures come from, our stained glass. But another, another thing about stained glass, though, is that stained glass is meant to have light shine through it. Stained glass is not able to be seen unless light shines through it. And one of the ways that we think about symbol in, in the Episcopal Church and in the church wider is that we can't gaze on the revelation of Christ without the light of Christ. Light has to shine through this. And so we gaze at Christ, we gaze at God through the depictions, but ultimately it's about the light that illumines these things. It's not of our own will, but it's the light that illumines what we see. So even in our stained glass, you can see that enacted. And again, all of this stuff is in the nave, the place where we sit to worship. But before we move forward, notice something with me, which is that architecturally, where are your eyes guided towards? Undoubtedly, your eyes are guided towards the front, right? It's something subtle, but it bears, uh, it bears saying. Think of the symmetry that you see between all of the things that lead up to the altar. 
the high vaulted ceilings narrow down in that big apse um, that you see, that curved apse uh, that divides the more kind of rose colored room or warm colored room from the uh, kind of turquoise blue that is around our altar. You can tell it's even a different section uh, by the way that that apse uh, designates it. Um, and your sight lines are drawn towards the altar. And specifically, if you think about it, the thing that's in the, the, the right smack center of the picture right now is the cross itself. Your eyes are drawn to the cross. And in fact, um, where I usually will sit is actually out of the way. During the times when I'm not saying prayers or when I'm not uh, doing things that are particular to the priesthood, I'm actually out of the way of the altar uh, because the symbol of Christ is the altar. Um, it is, uh, in a lot of ways, a very, very powerful symbol, of which we're going to talk about more specifically here in a minute. But just notice that even when you sit in the pews, your eyes are drawn to the altar. And that is no mistake. That, that is by design, because the altar is the symbol of Christ. And it also is where our gaze should go, because um, despite what smart things I might say, even though I hope that the Holy Spirit works through me, despite what things we might do within the service, the most important person that we come to worship on Sundays is Jesus. And so Jesus is front and center, and the symbol that we all almost universally recognize the symbol of Christ is the cross. So with that, we are going to take our field trip a little farther in. As we come up, we are going to step up these small little steps right here to this little platform. And where we are right now is at the very base of what is called the chancel. If you see from side to side where that rail begins, where that little railing begins, that is where the chancel begins. And the chancel is where you'll see clergy seated, where you'll see our choir seated, where you'll see our ministers seated that assist with the service. But the chancel also contains within it some, some helpful symbolism as well. When you look at the chancel, what you'll often see is you'll see these rails that divide this as another section. But think of where the choir sits. The choir sits up here, along with the clergy, and the people are worshiping down there in the congregation, and they all are drawn in focus to the altar in the front. But the symbol of the choir is actually really important. Because if you think about the choir, which were usually robed in white, um, the choir is a symbol of the choirs of angels singing holy, holy, holy. They are a ministry in and of themselves, a symbol in and of themselves. And so they reside next to the altar because of the throne room scenes that we get in the book of the Revelation. The clergy are seated here so that we are able to be seen by the congregation, um, I'm also seated up here by the altar in the sanctuary. Um, but the point is, is that the chancel is a symbol of the gateway into the heavenly realm, where the sanctuary itself, the holy of holies, so to speak, um, is meant to be the symbol of where Christ resides. And even within the uh, temple of the Old Testament, we take a lot of our kind of symbolism in the neo-Gothic architecture. In the temple, you have different courts that you go in, and the one in which the high priest sacrifices once a year, think of Zechariah in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, is the Holy of Holies. 
in which Zechariah sees Gabriel standing by the mercy seat. And so the sanctuary is meant to be that as well. But the, but the particular um, symbolism of this chancel is that it contains the heavenly hosts acclaiming the glory of God, the ministers who are leading the service, the music that goes on, and our wonderful organ on this side. <coughs> but another thing that sometimes you might miss is notice, we're going to go way up here, notice that there is a cross up there. It's hard to see because the sun is bright in the front, but there's a cross up there, and there's a big, big beam that goes across the bottom of that trussing. That is called the rood, um, and that is called the rood cross. Now, uh, rood cross is kind of an oxymoron, um, or it's, it's kind of redundant, because rood, R-O-O-D, is what we translate the Latin as basically what the cross is. Um, the wood, so to speak, the beams on which Christ is hung. Um, and the rood is what separates the uh, nave from the chancel, um, the congregation where they are to where the chancel begins. So the rood is a really important symbol because when you come up for communion, you pass under the rood cross, entering into the chancel and to kneel at the altar rail to receive the holy sacrament underneath that big apse. Now, again, you see where that apse is, where that color change happens, where the warmer color turns into the turquoise blue. But again, even as you interact with the space and move in the space, you're actually interacting with deep symbol. Speaking of symbol, we're going to go this way. We're going to go from all the way to the right to the left. This over here is called the lectern. And this right here is where the readings will be done by the uh, members of the congregation who are the ministers, who are our readers. The holy scriptures are read from this lectern. And the readers in our congregation have some of the most important tasks um, of our everyday worship because they are the readers of the holy word of God. And when they read, they are reading for us the Word of God. Now, it's interesting because, again, remember about the stained glass windows and the idea of illiteracy. The reason why in the Episcopal Church you will hear Scripture read so often is because the act of oral hearing of the Word is different than the reading of the Word. The reading of the word, of course, is a primary way that we interact with the scriptures. But if you read out loud the holy scriptures, you all of a sudden get a completely different sense of what the scriptures are saying. When you read it, instead of it being text on a page, when you read it out loud, like, for example, if you read St. Paul's letters in the kind of animated way that St. Paul writes, you will actually get an aural interpretation that might actually deepen your actual, actual uh, read interpretation. And so again, just because we can read something does not mean that there's not more depth that we gain by the Holy Spirit in the actual of the scriptures. In the early church, once again, People read this primarily. They didn't have little, little texts in front of them or pamphlets or, uh, thank goodness, the service printed out for them all on one nice little booklet like we do here. Um, they didn't have that. They only had people who were able to read who read it for them. In fact, St. Paul even, even tells at the end of his letters, of some of his letters, make sure to read this in the presence of the congregation. So these were read. They weren't necessarily um, they, they, these were read uh, out loud. They were orally said, not this was just read by eyes on the page. So, reading, really important uh, aspect of our worship. And again, the ritual behind that is that we actually uh, begin the books in a very ritual 
heavy way. We say what book it is, we read, and then after we get done reading, we say the word of the Lord. And the congregational response is, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God for the Holy Scriptures of God. Let's read it. This right here is our votive rack. Now again, think about the heaviness of symbol. Votive racks are often used to commemorate, remember, and prayer for those who, have, who are deceased. One of the reasons why the votive rack um, is such a powerful um, devotion is because our beloved dead, especially those who are in Christ, those who have reposed in Christ, we actually pray that they go from strength to strength, that they go from glory to glory in the presence of Christ forever, and that they continue in that forever and ever, and that they find their peace and the hope in the resurrection. And so whenever you see a photograph like this, you often see matches that one will light to then light and say a prayer for their dearly beloved God. But the light that is lit is not simply a symbol of a single person, but it's a symbol of the light of Christ in that person. We live, we do not live in and of ourselves. But rather, it is the light of Christ within us. And so as we light our candle, in commemoration of those whom we love, our beloved, or even those who are, uh, who we especially name in intention for prayer, often what I will do is I will say a traditional prayer that usually ends uh, some of the more historic daily offices of St. Benedict, which is, may the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. And that is what this important symbolic act of lighting a candle, even as simple as that can be, can do, where we remember the light of Christ within those who we love. But the most important one out of all these three is the baptismal font. The baptismal font right here is, of course, where we have water. And this is where we baptize. This is where we, we enjoin into Christ's household, the church, those who have come forward for baptism. Now, what you'll see is something interesting about this. Notice the shape. It's octagonal. There are eight sides to this. And in fact, on the sides, you'll see the cross, but then you'll see some interesting kind of symbols right there. Someone kind of joked with me and asked if that was a dollar sign. Um, and the answer is no, it's not a dollar sign. But you'll see the eight sides. The eight sides of the baptismal font is actually meant to symbolize the days of the week. Now, I hear you saying, now, wait a minute, there aren't eight days in a week. Well, that's the point. The eighth day is the day of the resurrection. And symbolically in the church, that's what the eighth side symbolizes. Um, in some ways, the days, the other uh, sides symbolize the times of life. But the eighth day is, a symbol, uh, is symbolic of the resurrection. On the sides, you will see the cross. This is what is sometimes known as the Greek cross. It is equal length on its, on its, on its uh, width and its, uh, and its height. But right here, it might be harder to see, but you'll see the cross right here. But what's embedded in here, for those of whom have seen this before, are three letters. There's an S right here that you can see. If you look close, there's an H. And if you look real close, there is a single bar in the middle, and that's usually an I. I-H-S is the transliteration of the first three letters of Jesus' name. And you will see the I-H-S on a lot of things. Because, it, because, again, it's all about Jesus. And, of course, whenever we baptize, we pour water over the head of those who come three times in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
as the early church did, and welcome them into the household of God. And that is the baptismal font. On the other side, you will see the pulpit. The pulpit is, of course, where the preacher stands. And the pulpit has a couple of symbols on it that it might be hard to see. You'll see the three rings right here, which for most of you, you probably recognize this is the Trinitarian symbol. This is the Trinity. But also, there is another symbol that's on the front, which looks like the letter P and the letter X, right here. This is something called the Chi Rho, or um, the Chi is a Greek letter X, and the Rho is a Greek letter that looks like a P, but, it's, but, it, but it is pronounced as an R. And the chi rho x r is the first two letters of Christ, Christos, if that makes sense. The chi rho is the symbol of Christ. And you will see that on various things as well. Again, as you can probably tell, it's all about Jesus. And the reason why the pulpit is adorned with those things is because the role of preachers is a very important role in that preachers are charged with the explication, the teaching, the exhortation of the gospel truth, but particularly in ways that people can understand. It is our commentary on the holy word of God. And so those are all of the interesting symbols you can see within the chancel. But now, of course, let's get to where the action happens. Now we go up to the sanctuary. The sanctuary, or even in the word sanctuary, is the word sanctus, or holy. The sanctuary is the holy place. The place where we do holy things. Not included in there is plugging in my phone to make sure I don't lose battery. But think about what you see up here. Again, if you look at the very center, you'll see the IHS again, because, of course, Jesus. In fact, if you look real close on what's called the chalice veil, which is this little thing on the very top, you'll see IHS again. And on either side, you'll see Alpha and Omega. In fact, you'll see it both on the frontal, which is the green thing that hangs on the altar, and the altar face itself, on either side with the gold leaf in the background. And of course, the Alpha and the Omega is a reference to the Revelation passage at the very Revelation in chapter 20, where God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. It is the symbol of Christ. On the altar itself, we're going to get to that in just a moment, but in on the backing of the altar, you will see the high cross, which is the symbol, the central symbol of our faith in Christ. And it is a symbol that is a real symbol of death. Those who would be my disciples deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. But also, you'll notice all the candles. There are three candles on either side of the high cross on the back. The two taller candles, um, the two taller candles that are right here and right here, those two are on the altar, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But the three candles on either side of the cross are a symbol of the Trinity. 
the Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Sometimes in, uh, in uh, different uh, parishes, they'll be called the Big Six because they're usually really tall candles, which is why the, uh, the apses, um, the little uh, kind of um, oval-looking points, points at the back of what's called the reridus, which is this big uh, square thing right here that falls along right there. That's called the reridus. Those would be where the candles would be, and sometimes in those apses you will have other icons of Jesus Christ, other pictorial depictions of Jesus or of the disciples or of the angels um, that are in the backing of it. But it's the central symbol of the faith, because this is where we do the Holy Eucharist. Or as if you've been following along, that is where we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. And there's a lot of adornment that's going on in this, right? There's a lot of different things going on. Everything is dressed in a green color. Everything is very carefully placed. In fact, you can see on this side right here, a little table that has some stuff on it. You'll see a little thing sitting right here that we'll talk about. Um, but there's a whole lot of symbolism in here, right? including the banners on either side, the bread of heaven and cup of salvation, which of course is pointing towards the fact that we do Holy Communion up here. But perhaps you're asking, well, okay, that sounds great. Uh, why all the symbol? Why all this stuff? Well, symbol is a way that we interact with something bigger than what we can understand. We will never in our lifetimes understand the breadth and the height and the depth of Christ's love and the mystery of Christ's death and resurrection. And one of the ways that we actually point towards this is through our symbol. We know and we interact with the symbols even though we cannot grasp the full gravity of them. Even though we name the name of Jesus Christ, we don't necessarily say that we know everything about Jesus. As God is unsearchable and Jesus Christ is God, that we have about an eternity to, to learn all about Jesus and all about God. But, once again, the way that we interact with these symbols is a very important way. So let's talk about some of the outward symbols that are not necessarily just in the architecture or in the adornment, but let's talk about the symbols that you will see people interact with with physical gestures. So for example, whenever you see people interact with the symbols of our faith, you will see certain gestures being made that might strike you, um, especially in the Bible Belt South, as, well, that looks Catholic. Well, guess what? We Anglicans are Catholic. We Episcopalians do, do name ourselves Catholic. We're English Catholics. And just because it looks Catholic doesn't mean that it's not Christian. In fact, there is a whole bunch of stuff that we can learn from the Roman Catholic Church because there is something to be said for the fact that the Roman Catholic Church hailed from when the church was undivided. So let's, instead of saying, well, that looks Catholic, ask, why do people do certain things? The, very, the most simple one that we can think of, actually, is the sign of the cross. You see me do this all the time. In fact, there was one time when I was uh, at university, when I was uh, sitting down, uh, and, and um, I, it was a busy day, and so I was trying to get to the cafeteria to eat my lunch so I can get on my way. Well, after I get done with blessing, uh, with asking God's blessing over my meal, I make the sign of the cross like this. And one of my friends from um, from university um, comes uh, uh, comes up uh, to me uh, later that day. He had seen me saying my prayer over my meal, and he's like, "I had no idea you were Catholic." And of course, you know, now you have to figure out how to respond to that, right? Because what he was meaning was Roman Catholic, but not all Roman Catholics. Um, 
Catholics will make that sign, but not all Catholics are Roman Catholics, if that makes sense. Um, and that's something that's hard to kind of talk about in ways that are understandable, um, but it is something that we as the Episcopal Church claim. We claim to be part of the one holy Catholic apostolic church, but we don't claim to be Roman Catholic. But that doesn't make us any less Catholic. Um, in the true sense of that word, which means pertaining to the whole, kata polis, pertaining to the whole. So whenever you make the sign of the cross like this, it's because you're Christian, not because you're of a particular denomination, because the sign of the cross is a prayer. In fact, you'll see people, whenever they come in, um, touch the baptismal and make the sign of the cross over themselves like this. The sign of the cross is a prayer. It's not necessarily a single prayer, but if you see in the context of the service itself, the sign of the cross will come out at certain times. Most commonly, you'll see the sign of the cross used whenever we invoke the name of the Holy Trinity. Like, for example, at the beginning of the service, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if you think about the motion of, of where this happens, Father, our Father who art in heaven, locatively up and of the son the descending of christ to earth the father the son christ who descended so moving down and the holy spirit moving from side to side the procession of the spirit coming from god this idea of father son and holy spirit that's one way you can understand that symbolic act but another way is, of course, in the, in the baptism, we are remembering our baptism. We are making the sign of the cross over ourselves because we are no longer our own. We are Christ's now. We are no longer owned by ourselves. We are God's possession. We have been adopted into God's family as sons and daughters of the Most High. And in reminder of that, the dipping of the baptismal water and the sign of the cross over ourselves is a reminder, a very important reminder, that we are gods. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. In Eastern Orthodoxy, actually, even how you sign yourself with your fingers is important. Because in Eastern Orthodoxy, they take these two fingers under your thumb and they press them together like this. And you'll see these, the Eastern Orthodox bless themselves like this. Because the symbol of your fingers is they confess Jesus as God and man made one. Like that. Again, the symbol of the sign of the cross is a prayer, a reminder of our love of God in various ways, whether it be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or whether it be remembering our baptism, marked as Christ's own forever, or whether it be the confession of Jesus as fully God and fully man. So that's what you'll see. But you'll see, as many people do, is that we have something uh, that is um, sometimes called Episcopal callous thanks. We get up, we sit down, and we kneel. We do a lot of that. But what do those mean? Well, think about what it means to stand up in the presence of someone who walks in. It's a sign of honor, right? Standing is a sign of honoring the presence of someone. And so you'll see people in the congregation, whenever we enter in with the cross, we, we follow the, the Holy Cross in a procession. We go from the back of the church all the way to the front of the church. We enter into the sanctuary following the cross, someone carrying the symbol of our faith. But people stand up because they are reverencing. You'll see people actually bow to the cross because we are reverencing the symbol of Jesus Christ. We're not worshiping the, we're not worshiping the piece of metal that is the symbol of this. We're worshiping what the symbol is meaning. As St. John of Damascus would say,